Well, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your abundant blessings, and uh, thank you for the beautiful truth that you have given to us. And as we uh, continue exploring the things that we can do to cooperate with you in this process of transformation, of healing, of restoration, we ask for you to bless us with your Holy Spirit, teach us, and draw us ever close to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue considering this topic of love, uh, I want to explore uh, some aspects of it that at the beginning don't seem to create very much controversy, but when we get into it, it does. Love actually is controversial. And if you don't think love is controversial, just ask Jesus. His life was controversial. <clears throat> and he came to represent love. So right now I want to, let's talk about the interrelationship between love and liberty. And we'll look at the, the interrelationships between love and liberty. You see, human love, what we're used to, what we see operating in human hearts, uh, operates in a predictable manner, and that is that when you have a high interest in someone, then you will manifest high control, and they have low freedom. So the more interest you have in somebody, the more control that you manifest, the less freedom that they have. Whereas if you have low interest in somebody, then you're going to give them more freedom and you have less control that you exert over them. For example, you go walking down the road <clears throat> and uh, you're going through town and there's some old guy smoking a cigarette uh, while you're walking downtown. You notice it and likely you're just going to pass by and sometimes you won't even have a second thought about it or hardly even notice it. But this time you're walking downtown and you take a look and it's your... 14-year-old son who is smoking a cigarette on the side of the road, do you notice? Of course. Do you just pass by? No. As you said, you take action. Right? You take action. <clears throat> so you might go over there, take the cigarette, pull it out of their mouth, throw it on the ground, stomp on it, grab them by the ear, drag them back home, and you and they are going to have a serious discussion, right? Maybe you stop by the corner market on the way and you buy three packs of cigarettes and you take them home, stick them in the shed and say, all right, you light the first one, give it to them here. You gotta smoke this until, it, until the filter. And then the next one, you gotta smoke that one until the filter and the next one and the next one. And two and a half packs later, they are puking their guts up all over the place and you let them know how good the thing they are is try that they're trying. <laughs> I'm not recommending that you do that. Of course, somebody's going to listen to this and go, oh, 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 yes. I'm like, you know, we, we do something. You might ground them. You might do whatever. Um, remember, we must control the sources we do not trust. We must control the sources that we do not trust, and we control our sources in order to protect our interests, right? to protect our our love sources. We do this with God too, right? There are ways that we try to control him. We try to do this or do that, behave this way, behave that way, offer this sacrifice, do this thing so that we can manipulate God to do this or that for us. We kind of barter with God that way. Uh, we'll give him tithes and offerings and time and service and, and so on. And in return, we're looking for repentance and acceptance and belonging and security and eternal life and heaven and streets of gold and so on. Sometimes we see him as the genie in the bottle. If we simply rub the lamp just the right way, we just do the right things, then we'll get our three wishes. Hmm. But faith is not the hand that rubs the genie lamp to get our three wishes. Faith is the hand that holds on to God regardless what happens. Yeah. And um, Divine love is not like human love. You see, divine love is interesting. It can have a, a very high interest in somebody, and at the same time, it can provide them complete freedom. 
complete freedom when it has high or total interest in the other individual. Go ahead and take the picture because there's not another one on that one. <coughs> For example, anybody know that a Twinkie is bad? Mm -hmm. I'll go back to for your sake. Yeah, anybody know that Twinkies are bad? Right, they're not considered a health food. <laughs> they would not be found on the health food section of a store, the health food you know store, and all that kind of stuff. Maybe, may, have you ever eaten a Twinkie? Yeah. I have. Yeah, I've me too. I've had I've had lots of them. And did you know that they were bad when you ate them? No. Come on, did you know it was health food? Okay, it wasn't a vegetable, right? Do you have an idea that it would probably lead in a bad direction or a good direction with your health? Yeah, I mean, I knew it was bad, but I ate it anyways because it tasted good. <laughs> and I like that. I, I have a sweet tooth. What about deep fat fried Twinkies? Yeah, I haven't had it either, but I found out about it and I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah, deep fat fried Twinkies. Is that healthy for you? Uh, absolutely not, right? And, and do you know that before you ever try one? Yeah, you got an idea it's bad before you do that. Does God know it's not healthy for you? Yeah, of course he does. Does he know that it's going to contribute to your dying earlier than you would have otherwise if you hadn't consumed it or continued to consume it? Yeah, of course. Does God ever get that Twinkie, knock it out of your hand, grab you by the ear, drag you back home, and ground you for the rest of the month because you ate that Twinkie? No. Does he allow you to eat if you, if you so choose to do so? Yeah, he'll do that. He allows you to do it. And in fact, if you want to put the Twinkie in your mouth again, and the next one again, and the next one again, and you continue doing so for... For the next 10, 15, 20, 35 years, he'll let you do it every time. He will not force you to do good, neither will he prevent you from doing evil. You can kill yourself quickly or slowly if you so choose. He will give you the freedom to do so. He will respect your choice. Now, he says, come now, let us reason together. So God will reason with you. He will send his angels. He will send his Holy Spirit. He will, in a, in a way, tap on your shoulder and say, you know what, you really shouldn't be doing that because it's going to lead you down a, a not-so-good pathway. But we have the choice to either listen or not listen, to either go ahead or not go ahead. God reasons with us, but the choice is left to us, and he will not prevent us from making the choice in a bad direction nor will he force us to make the choice in a good direction. He gives us choice. He gives us that freedom to do so. <clears throat> in fact, he needs to maintain love, and love can only be love if it's built on the framework of freedom. And so if he were to erode freedom, he would erode love. And you would be left with robots or automatons. So in order to give us the freedom to love, he has to preserve our capacity to disobey, to rebel, to choose something else. And because he loves us so completely, so perfectly, he gives us complete freedom to destroy ourselves or to follow him if we so choose. You see, God's love, real love, it gives perfect liberty to choose the good or the bad. Either or. But when you and I t attempt to control others, we are operating outside of love. Since we're created in the image of God, and we were created to think and act like God does, and our body was created to respond perfectly to love. But when we control others, we're operating outside of love, and the result is damage to the soul or the body. We cannot maintain proper function if we're operating outside of the context of love. In fact, when you deal with individuals that have broken bodies and broken constitutions, one of the causes of their disease may be control. Control of others. For the good. Controlling others for the good. 
And it's true even when we control others for the good. We believe something to be right. We want those whom we love to be right, so we try to control them to do right so that they can be right. And, of course, be a good source for us because we're doing it for many times selfish motives. And so we try to fix them to match what we understand is good, and when they don't respond, we're frustrated, we're upset. Perhaps we even try to control them in a different way or more forcefully to obtain compliance and uniformity. And those we have as the greatest treasure are those whom we try to control the most. But we also try to control others rel relative to ideas or principles that are dear to us. So we will control strangers if in doing so it relates to a particular idea or ideal or principle that we're passionate about. And so our actions are still from the motive of selfishness and the result is still an attempt to control others. And this selfish human propensity, when it goes unchecked, will eventually lead us not just to limit the freedom of those who don't comply with our ideas of right, but to destroy them if they refuse to comply and conform with our, our ideals. That's the foundation of the erosion of our religious liberties. And it will be seen more and more clearly in this great country over the next few years. You'll see American liberties removed, restrictions imposed, increasing penalties, for non-conformity and eventually down the line will be a death penalty for those who refuse to comply. Even though the ideals that they suppose they are following are opposed, directly opposed to the word of God. Looking back to God and his love and the perfect freedom by which it operates, I am not saying that real freedom can be found in choosing whatever I want and in going in whatever direction I want to go. True freedom is only found within the confines, the context of the boundaries of God's law. We're told here, true liberty and independence are found in the service of God. His service will place upon you no restriction that will not increase your happiness. In complying with his requirements, you will find a peace, contentment, and enjoyment that you can never have in the path of wild license and sin. Then study well the nature of the liberty you desire. Is it the liberty of the sons of God to be free in Christ Jesus, or do you call the selfish indulgence of base passions freedom? Such liberty carries with it the heaviest remorse. It is the cruelest bondage. So again, lest we think that liberty to do anything and everything you want is freedom or liberty, it's not. Liberty is always within the confines of God's law with his will. And so looking back to God and his love and the perfect freedom by which it operates, I'm not saying that God's love allows us to, allows evil to happen without consequences. He does not allow evil to happen without consequences. There are consequences. There are always consequences. They just might not come right away, but they will come. It's a divine law that whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And the same law shows us that he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. There are consequences to the decisions that we make. So how does God train his sinful wayward children if he does not prevent them from doing the wrong? Right? If he will not force them to do the right, nor will he prevent them from doing the evil, then how does he teach them to stay in the right when they have sinful propensities? He does so through consequences. He will teach them and educate them and warn them and reason with them, give them examples of others who have made the same decisions, all so that he can give them the best information from which to make their decision, but the decision is theirs. Right. And when the decision is made, there are specific consequences to that decision, and God teaches us through the consequences. They are there for the purpose of diverting us from the wrong and leading us back towards the right. To give 
discomfort, even pain, and so on, as we deviate away from God's will, that we might be motivated to come back into God's will. Right? Remember, he's the good shepherd. He's, he's searching for the lost sheep so that he can lovingly carry them back home. The consequences are not for our destruction. They're not because he hates us. They're not just to arbitrarily punish us. The consequences are not to abandon us. The consequences are for the purpose of restitution, of restoration, of bringing the individual from a state of rebellion into a state of cooperation. In fact, the relationship between love and freedom is so fundamental that it creates a relationship between sin and grace. Hmm. There is a relationship between sin and grace. We sin by God's grace. I know, it's a big question mark. Right? We sin by God's grace. What do you mean? Well, by whose power do you live? Whose life do you live by? Did Satan give you power? Does he give you life? Does he preserve you? No. Who gives you the power so that you can talk and move and do whatever you do? It's God. God does. He's the source of life. If he ceased to give you power, if he ceased to give you life, you'd die. No chance to sin or continue in it. Right? So anytime someone kills, anytime someone hurts, anytime someone does bad things to others, they are doing so by their own will, but with his power. They're doing so by their own will. He gives them freedom to choose evil if they so desire. But they're doing so by his power. Is God happy about that? Does he like that? No. He tells us in Isaiah 43, 24, he says, But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. God has pledged himself to maintain the life and power of we who sin so that he might give us an opportunity to see his love, to understand his character, to, to come back into a love relationship with him that we might be redeemed from the fall. But in the process of giving us time so that we might do that, God pledges himself to keep us alive while we do evil with his power and his life. So while, we, while he is maintaining our life, we are causing him to serve with our sins. And God hates sin. He absolutely hates it because it counterworks everything that he stands for. But he must preserve love at all costs. He must preserve the capacity to choose. Even when one makes that choice, to go against God in his way and to hurt his children. You see, we're free moral agents and God loves us supremely. And he created us with the capacity to love him in return. But love cannot be love if it's on involuntary. It must be voluntary in order to be love. Love necessitates the freedom of choice. And freedom of choice freedom of will allows for the possibility of service or the possibility of rebellion. And in order to preserve the capacity to love, he must preserve the capacity to be selfish, to hurt, to destroy. Mm. You see, love is controversial. Because when we understand the foundations of love, it brings us to these questions of if God is a God of love, why is there so much pain? And why did this or that or the other thing happen to me?
Because he is a God of love, he must preserve love. He must preserve the freedom upon which love can exist. And we, individually, are responsible for misusing that freedom and hurting others and ourselves with it. So if love is so necessary that it is to be maintained at such extreme cost, then what does this love look like? Well, let's go to the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. And we'll begin in verse 4 and look at what love looks like with some slight paraphrasing. <laughs> So in verse 4, we're told that love suffers long and is kind. So when I live by love, the following will be true. I will not be exempt from suffering. Love suffers long, right? I will not be exempt from suffering. Jesus says well, that um, in this world you will have tribulation. We are not exempt from suffering. He says, I have sent you amongst the wolves. In fact, I can suffer, and I can suffer for a long time with love. And, and not only that, but I can suffer for a long time and be kind while I suffer. And not only that, I can be I can suffer for a long time and I can be kind to the one who causes my suffering for a long time. That's what love can do. Love does not want what you have because I recognize that God is my source, not you. And I'm happy that you have what you have because the Lord has blessed you with it. I don't need your stuff. I need God. Love doesn't do things to make people look at me to notice me or to think good of me or, or anything like that. In fact, I avoid doing things publicly that would draw attention to myself. My motivation for what I do is not what you think. It is what God thinks. And he knows the heart, so I don't need to prove anything to him. Yes, my life will bear fruit, but it's not for the purpose of proving it's because I love him. Love does not put others down so that I feel bigger or more important. Love doesn't try to look more holy, nicer, prettier, or anything else. I don't need a fancy clothes, makeup, or jewelry. I don't need a nice car, a nice home, or anything else to embellish who I am. I'm content with how God has made me. Love does not behave rudely to those who are rude to it. In fact, I treat them with patience and kindness, compassion and love. Love does not seek its own rights. Now, love is not American. I tell you, because Americans are all about their own rights. Right? Love does not seek its own rights. It will allow myself to be taken advantage of without retaliation or resistance, recognizing that if God allows it, he will work it out for good and give me strength to endure. And if I allow God to work it out in his time and in his way, he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. While I do not seek my own rights, I do uphold the rights of others. I do. Love cannot be provoked. In other words, love has no buttons. You can't find a button on love in order to make it to respond in a provocative manner. Angry, upset, frustrated, and so on. Because those hurts have been healed. Love thinks no evil about you. I assume that your motives are pure for why you are doing what you're doing. I understand you're coming where you're coming from, and in compassion, I pray for you, with you if possible, patient with you. My thoughts about you are positive ones. 
Love gives me no pleasure when you sin, when you fall, when you fail. My concern is for your best good. Your sin hurts me because I hurt for you and what the sin is doing in your life. I cry for you in prayer, intercede in your behalf, lifting you up before the Father in heaven. And it's my greatest joy and rejoicing when the truth of God's word is accepted in the heart and it sets you free. Love is able to carry anything, no matter how big or how bad. There's nothing in my life, in my associations, in my experience, or whatever, that God is not acquainted with and that he has not made provision for. God, who is love, can and did bear all things. And knowing me intimately, he has pledged that he will not allow anything to come to me that I cannot bear. Remember, he promised us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men, that God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. Even the temptation to sleep. Therefore, I can bear all things that come to me because they're filtered by God first. I can overcome in each and every situation and temptation. Love leaves me no excuse for failure because it gives everything needed to overcome. Even the sleepies. Love believes all things that God has promised. I don't know. They're snoring pretty soon. So, love believes all things that God has promised because we trust in him. We know that he is trustworthy and we can rely upon those promises of God. Faith has grown to the point that I surrender all to him. Love has great hope because I know that God is trustworthy and I can confidently, confidently hope for that which he promised. And love is able to withstand anything and everything. Love is the greatest power in the universe. There is no greater power. Force, coercion, shame, guilt, threats, abuse, deception, temptation are all powerless to overcome love because it's infinitely greater than all these things. They will never, or there will never be anything that can come along that can overpower and outdo love if love is the motivation and experience of the life I will endure to the end. And because of what love is and who love is, it will never fail. Never. It will be victorious at last. So now that we have a picture of what love is, let's go back through verses 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not this love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not this love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, burned but have not this love, it profits me nothing. John 77, 21 through 23, it, it says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And what we read in 1 Corinthians 13 and, and here in John 7, 21 to 23, it, well, it tells me that selfishness can do a lot of apparent good. Selfishness can appear to do all of these different things, 
that fools many into believing that it's, real, that it's the real thing, even those in whom it resides and who are doing the things are deceived to believe that they're genuine when they're not. How can God ever say, I never knew you, to those who are apparently working for him? Well, I think it's because there's one thing that God recognizes, and that's love. And when what is done is done outside of the context of love, it is unrecognized. It is only when it is done within the context of love that it's recognized. And the question that we must ask ourselves is, does God recognize us? Does he? And if not, we must come and stay at the cross, bleeding for that new heart until we are assured that we have it. That we have the peace of God in our hearts. And then plead with him to live out his life through you by his Holy Spirit to keep you in that new heart as you cooperate with him. Number eight, we're getting close to the end. We only have 10 points. So number eight, what do we do? We need to remember it's not mine. Uh, this is a frequent challenge to remember that it's not mine. This can be a frequent challenge multiple times a day, maybe sometimes multiple hours of the day. Maybe multiple times each hour. Remembering it's not mine. Because we have the tendency to be owners and not stewards. And we forget the fact that we're stewards so frequently. We think that this is mine, that's mine, the other thing is mine, and the other thing is mine. And so we treat everything as if it's mine. And, and it can be on multiple different fronts. Sometimes it helps me to remember that my children are not mine. Actually, frequently it helps to remember that my children are not mine. They're his. They're only mine as a stewardship. He has only lent them to me for a particular time that I might share with them the love of God and to help them to learn to love him in return. And, uh, and when my children rebel and they have those rebellious attitudes, then I need to remember and be reminded, it's not mine. Lord, that's not my child. They're yours. And the authority that they are rejecting is not my authority, it's yours. So, since it's a delegated authority and it doesn't belong to me, and that's a delegated child, it doesn't belong to me either, then what would you have me to do with your authority with this child of yours at this time? And when you have that, that idea, when you have that thought, then you don't get all emotionally caught up in everything that's going on. You don't get swallowed up in the frustration. You don't get swallowed up in the anger and all of that stuff when that's the case. Now, I'm waiting for the day when that will be a consistent case for me. The Lord's still working on my heart. Right? I'm not there yet. But I see the goal, and I'm pressing for the mark, even though I fall along the way, right? And, um, and yes, that, that remembrance is a frequent remembrance. It's not mine, it's not mine, it's not mine, it's not mine. And when it's not mine, I don't have to take it so personally. I don't have to cling to it so thoroughly. I don't have to go there. I can let it be in his hands. So let's consider love in relationship to trust and protection. Love trusts. If I, if I love God, then I can trust him. And, and if I trust in God, I don't need to be my own protector because he has promised to be my protector. He is my strong tower. He is my shield. He is my fortress. You remember a, a story of a, of a lone man whom the army was going to take? It's an old story in the Old Testament, and 
This king was not happy because every time he went somewhere to lay an ambush, people found out about his ambush, and he was wondering who of his people was squealing on him and telling the enemies what was going on. And finally somebody said, because he was getting angry enough that they thought he was, the, you know, the king was going to kill all of these people that he's working with. Because there's some, there's some spy here, some traitor in the midst of this, and somebody's like, oh, oh it's not us. It's the prophet Elisha. What you say in your bedroom, he hears it, and he tells the king of Israel, and the king of Israel then knows. And so the king was not happy about that. So he sent the entire army at night to go surround the city of Dothan, where, where prophet Elisha was. And, and that poor servant of Elisha wakes up in the morning and goes out to have his morning devotions, and he's going to go take a walk. And, <gasps> oh, no. They're under siege. They're surrounded by the enemy army. And, and these, were, these were the bad guys. These were the ones that would cut off party parts. Like you might surrender and you might get out of the city, but you didn't get out of the city without losing something. That's what, that's what their nation was known for. Um, they were bad people. And, and so this, this young man was just like in shock and he runs back to the goes, runs back to the prophet, and he says, oh, we're surrounded. And, of course, I'm using my own paraphrase, and the prophet says, of course we are. What's you, what are you worried about? <laughs> of course we're surrounded. Why are you worried? And the young man's just confused. <laughs> and the old man knows. <laughs> And he prays and he says, Lord, open his eyes. He is so short-sighted. Put some glasses on that young man so that he can see. And the young man goes back out and he looks over the wall and he sees, indeed, they are surrounded by an army of angels. Yeah, they might have been surrounded by the enemy army. Did they need to be worried about it? Did, 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 uh, did the prophet then have to come up with some plan whereby he might protect himself, save himself from the situation? Uh, no, no. He was, he was in his father's will, doing what his father would have him to do, and there was protection in that. I can trust him to protect me as he sees fit. In Luke 6, 27 to 36, we read, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Love is controversial. The old heart cannot do this. It's only the new heart, recreated by the love and grace of God, that can respond with love to those who hate you, curse you, and spitefully use you. Now, don't be mistaken thinking that when you have love, you'll be loved by all. Love, real love, has enemies. There are many who hate love. But with love in your heart, none of them will be your enemy. While you might be their enemy. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, strike him back. Give him a good karate chop. Defend yourself. Well, the natural response of the human heart is to defend itself. It's only by the strength of God that I can allow myself to be taken advantage of and then allow it to happen again. But why would I do that? Well, remember, God surrounds us with his presence and nothing can get through to harm me unless he gives permission. Only if he gives permission. And if he gives permission, it is only because he knows he can work it out for good. If it could not work out for good, it would not happen. It would not come. It could not. There was a young lady that we took care of while I was on my trauma surgery rotation. 
I don't know if I told you the story or not, but um, she had the uh, misfortune of breaking up with her boyfriend. And the real misfortune was that she had the boyfriend. <laughs> that was the misfortune. Breaking up with him was not the misfortune. It was just, the, it was him. And um, he was not exactly happy with this move uh, of hers. And uh, so he thought he was going to relieve the world of her presence. And so as she was parked at a red light, then he walked up next to her car, pulled the pistol, and shot her right through the window in the head. And I was on trauma surgery rotation, and, and she came in, and she had an entrance wound over here, and she had an exit wound down here. And so you know you draw the line between the two. It went through some valuable real estate on the way through. <coughs> um, she was run through a CT scanner to see uh, what was going on, and there was the very, the most interesting curiosity, and that was you couldn't see any bullet path through the brain. In fact, when all the investigations were done, what happened was the bullet came in, the softest part of the skull, tracked underneath the skin, underneath the, the soft tissues, wrapped around the skull, and came out the other side, as if it went directly through her head, but it never penetrated the skull. Physically impossible. There, there's no physics that can describe what happened to her. My conclusion of the matter is he intended evil for her, but God knew it would not work out for good. And so because it would not work out for good, the evil intention was not carried out. Now the man was still permitted to pull the trigger. And in this case, the bullet was permitted to come out of the gun. And the bullet was permitted to enter into her skin and travel around soft tissues and exit out the other side. And, and she was pretty much out as if she had been shot and through the head. But guess what kind of testimony she now has? One that she would never have had had it not happened. Of a God who loved her and preserved her in the time of her extremity, of her necessity. We're told to him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And I tell you, the human heart cannot do this. It can't. We will always fight back. And so it is only under the influence of love that we can do this. It's only the influence of God. It's only when we trust in him that we ourselves are in his care, that we can do this. From him who takes away your house, do not withhold your car either. Well, it says tunic and cloak, but you know, the common scenario that I run into is a scenario of divorce. You have two individuals that They've got such differences, they're not going to be living life together anymore, and now the question is, who gets the better lawyer so that who can get the most of the stuff after it all boils down? Well, you know what love would do. If, if the lawyer says, well, she gets the house, you get the car, then love would turn around and say, no, give her the car too. Give her the car, too. It's not my car, anyways. It's God's car. And I think he would be happy for her to have it. And, and by the way, if I, if I simply comply with what must be, I might be compliant, but if I don't have to give the car away and I choose to give it away, what am I then? 
I'm generous. I care. Right? Am I a victim now in that situation? No. Because I give it away. I'm willing to do so. Right? And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. If you're taken to court and sued, even if it's wrongly, don't go and counter sue. Let them have it. It wasn't yours anyways. It was God's. Let him deal with it. He can give you more when he knows that it's the right time and the right circumstances, just like Job. Job lost all ten of his children and every one of his possessions. And what did God do? He restored it all twofold. Twenty children and twice the possessions at the end. Paul tells us in Romans 12, 19 through 21, he says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with, with good. Oh, so foreign to the world. That's, how do you overcome evil in the world? with greater evil. How do you overcome force? With greater force. How do you overcome aggression? With greater aggression. That's how the world seeks to overcome, but no, we overcome evil with good. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Right? This golden rule will be our everyday rule when Christ and his love rules in our hearts. We'll be concerned about others, not ourselves. We'll do whatever we can to show them the love of God. Our yearning will be for them. Our prayers will be for them. Uh, we will want and desire and yearn after their salvation. And even if they are doing things that are terrible to us, we will love them. That's the way love is. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even selfishness can love those who love it. And if you do good to those who do good, to, do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even selfishness can do that. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back and usually add an interest, what good is that to you? Even selfishness can do that too. Right? Selfishness can mimic love in many different ways. Part of the time with most of the people or most of the time with some people, but only love can love everybody all the time. Only love can love everyone all the time. Only it can do good. Only it can lend cheerfully. But the motives are for self, are not for self, right? In real love. Love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Right? That's the God we serve. That's who he is. That's how he responds. You can slap him in the face as many times as you want to. Spit on him by your actions and your, 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 your responses and your continued rebellion and so on. And he continues to go after you. He paid the price for you. He loves you. He is seeking to redeem you back. If you are lost, it's because you would not be saved. But it's not because he would not pursue you. And it's not because he would not take you back. It's because you would not be taken back. Real love is divine, and I can only possess this love as Christ lives in my heart by faith. It is only the Spirit of God that gives love for hatred. To be kind to the unthankful and to the evil, to do good, hoping for nothing again, is the insignity of the, ins the insignia of the royalty of heaven, the sure token by which the children of the highest reveal their high estate. Hmm. Now that we've covered this topic of love a little bit more deeply, let's consider disease again, because now we're going to tie them all together. We're told in Ministry of Healing, page 127, disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. Of course, it's the violation of the laws of health that's a problem. That sets up conditions. Disease is on the good side of the equation. 
It's what is the body's attempt to free itself. All right? So disease is not the problem. The, the violation of law of health is. And then we're told in the case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. The cause should be ascertained. So when there is a ca the case of sickness or disease, and you as lifestyle educators and others, you're going to be working and helping people with disease. So we've got to think about this. If you're helping somebody with disease, you first must ascertain the cause. And if you're going to look for the cause, where do you go looking for the cause? Where's your sweet spot? We're told sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. So if nine-tenths of the diseases have their foundation here, and of course if you look up nine-tenths, you'll find some other references too. Nine-tenths coming from meat, and nine-tenths coming from, uh, or uh, if everybody did all that they knew to do, just what they knew to do, the nine-tenths of diseases would go away. So how does that all meet together with issues of the mind? Well, by what do you decide what you do? By the mind. That's right. So your choice of what to do is a mind issue. And a choice of what you don't do is a mind issue. All right, is there anybody here that does everything you know to do healthy in order to stay healthy? Put my hand down. Right. Yeah, me either. Right? I, I haven't met anybody yet that does everything they know to do to stay healthy. Everybody falls short. Everybody has a gap between what they know and what they do. Everybody. Except for Jesus. That's right. He's the only one that didn't have a gap. He did everything he knew <clears throat> to be healthy. Everybody else has a gap. We all live with a gap. And that gap is an issue of the mind. It's not an issue of the body. And, of course, what we've been talking about, what you think, has a direct impact upon the body, the cells and their function and homeostasis and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, nine-tenths of diseases have their foundation in the mind. So if you have 90% of the cause of disease coming through the mind, then wouldn't it make sense to aim your arrows that way? That when you're looking for a cause, you aim for the mind. And what's going on with the thoughts and the thinking and the beliefs and so on and so forth? Because there you're most likely to find the cause. Now 10% of the time you won't if you're aiming here. But 90% of the time you will. And I would rather aim for 90% than 10. <laughs> and of those mind issues, personal loss is a very large cause of disease. Personal loss. If I live under that old heart of human love of giving to receive, then I'm constantly living in personal loss because I didn't receive, I didn't receive enough, my treasure was taken away, I was left, I was rejected, they died, and I can't control those losses because I can't control them. And I'm dependent upon others to give, in order to give, in order for me to receive. And I can't control if someone rejects me or dies and how much they give and how much they don't. And that so I then accumulate loss, personal loss, and that accumulated personal loss then contributes to disease. And the greater the perceived loss, the more rapid and serious the physical decline. Now, some people don't like personal loss, so we can just throw the word stress in there. Everybody knows stress is associated with disease. All sorts of diseases are related to stress. But I'm just highlighting where stress comes from what it's composed of. But, 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 if I live by God's heart, operating by divine love, which is taking in order to give, then my only loss is if I keep that love to myself. And that's my choice. No one else's. And so now I'm in control. I'm not a slave to others. Uh, and, 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 and as long as I am taking from God and I am freely giving that love away with the other's best interest in mind, then that which God created me for is operating and I no longer have those losses that were the major contributor to disease. And if, it take, if I take the cause away, what must happen to the effect? Yeah, the effect is going to go away too. And so for the majority of people, 90%, 9 times out of 10, 
The solution to their disease is a new heart. Nine-tenths of the time, the solution to their disease is a new heart. Is disease only a love problem? No, but 90% of it is, like we said. So in searching for a cause, we should start here. Now that's not all. Ministry of Healing, page 127, goes on to say, not just that we are to uh, ascertain the cause, but unhealthful conditions should be changed. So we should change unhealthful conditions, which brings us to point number nine, using natural remedies and changing lifestyle. So on that note, we're going to pray, take a break, and come back. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving mercies and your greatness to us. Lord, thank you for love. And as we look at it more deeply, we do see it's controversial because it's completely opposite to the way this world thinks. It just doesn't seem to make sense to us, and yet it, 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 it does. And it's so beautiful and it's so wonderful. Lord, may we open our hearts to that love. May we accept from you that new heart. And in so doing, may we live as Christ lived and experience not just the salvation of Christ, but the healing of Christ too, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.